so hi everyone. My name is Charmaine Anderson. Um, I grew up on a 60 cow dairy farm outside of Melrose, Wisconsin, and my parents farmed for 24 years. Uh, we sold our dairy cows um, in December of 2019. Uh, my parents still have steers, so they're still farming. Um, yeah, so I am the county conservationist for Tremble County, and um, also here today is Rick Reisinger. He's our um, uh, conservation specialist. And our department helped organize this event and is one of the sponsors. Um, so what Trumple County Department of Land Management can do for landowners and farmers is that we can offer up to 70% cost share on conservation practices such as um, stream bank stabilizations, stream crossings, cattle lanes, manure storage facilities, waste storage closures, grass waterways, and so much more. Uh, we also cost share for first time nutrient management plans, <coughs> soil samples, and have a, a cover crop incentive. So we work one on one with farmers and landowners by offering technical advice about various land issues as well as put conservation practices on the ground. So with that, the next speaker um, that I will be introducing um, is Daniel Olson. Dan. Olson is a seventh generation dairy farmer from Lena, Wisconsin. He is also the owner of Forge Innovations, which is a forage um, consulting business that works with over 700,000 cows in 20 states. He enjoys developing innovative solutions to challenges in agriculture. So Dan, it's great to have you here. Um, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Hey, thanks for having me. <clears throat> is this mic working all right? Good. Good, thank you. Well, I had a good drive over this morning. Spent a lot of time on the road. I, I traveled last year on my, uh, I rent a vehicle actually, instead of own one for my work travel. Last year I put 90,000 miles on a rental vehicle. And this winter, it seems like every time I wanna go somewhere, it's snowing or icing or something else. And it was really nice to just have a Beautiful morning to drive for once. So, um, so yeah, I work in quite a few states. Uh, travel a lot. I work with primarily, you know, larger dairies, but uh, just because of the kind of the nature of what I do. Uh, and but the the challenges that we're facing uh, are pretty universal. Like I like I said, I'm the seventh generation there on our farm, and. Uh, we actually have a couple dairies now that we're operating. My dad is still involved on the home dairy. We milk about 170 cows. That's a certified organic dairy. And then we have a couple other farms. I have a 300 acre farm that's more of a conventional research farm. And then we have a genetic dairy. Um, and I have lots of children. We have, uh, we have nine children. So it is proof that I am home a little bit anyway. Uh, <laughs> we, we do have some interest in maintaining those and growing them and continuing on and hopefully hopefully there can be an eighth generation but there is this like generational pressure right like my talking to my grandpa who's 94 i still go over there every sunday evening and we visit them and uh, anytime you complain about anything you'll say well what's well, not as bad as the depression you know <laughs> and uh, or the dust bowl or something like so there's never anything quite as bad as that uh but we're constantly facing pressures in the industry. And maybe before we get into this, I'd like, to, so the main point of this talk is we're talking about more alternative cropping rotations and just to get us thinking of a different way to look at forage systems. So how many of you are growing corn? Okay, so quite a few. Okay, because that's, we're gonna talk about that a little bit and what that looks like and how we, uh, how we integrate and, and that into more of a sustainable cropping rotation. But we have a lot of challenges in the industry, whether it's you know, financial things like, uh, like just trying to cash flow, trying to survive, trying to keep the farm in place for the next generation. And then there's more long-term goals like soil health. Like our, and our previous speaker was just talking about this investment and trying to build up things. Um, I think as I work with larger dairies and, and even becoming more focused on small dairies, nutrient management is a huge issue. 
Like, when do you put manure on? How do you handle it? How, how do you balance your nutrients um, on your farm? And as we get into you know, larger dairies, it becomes even more critical on how do you manage phosphorus load in your soils? And then maybe thinking about other things, like you, know, like you might have goals, like, well, we would really like to be no-till. Right? We, but maybe our farm isn't quite ready, but how can we build a system that would favor that and make that more um, profitable? And, and all of these things can be accomplished, but we need to think like more big picture, like systems approaches to things. And one of the things that you'll notice though, is that you know, the easiest thing to do is just to shoot down new ideas. And I'm not saying that everything I'm gonna say today, you're gonna wanna take home and do, like, or do it right now, but it's more of a way to just start thinking outside of the box, be a little more proactive. And the one thing that we noticed, and this was two, three years ago, we had all kinds of winter kill in like alfalfa. And it was an opportunity when all the alfalfa was dead for a lot of my dairies, it was an opportunity to start thinking differently about things. Or in 2019 when we had prevent plant and it was the first of July and we had dairies that didn't have any corn planted yet because it was just kept raining. And, it, and of course it was, <laughs> it was a tough situation and a lot of stress even on myself because we had built forage systems for dairies that were no longer viable and we had to rip it up and start over. But there was an opportunity and there was things that we learned in those kind of years that we're able to roll forward now and become better farmers and, and more set up for success in the future. So if you're planting corn, there's kind of a normal, we talk about crop rotations. There's, there's, there's two main rotations that farmers use. And the first would be just grain farmers doing corn and soybeans and going back and forth. And I would argue that's not really a rotation, but whatever, that, it's not enough to break an insect cycle. It's not really enough to build soils, but it certainly is better than corn on corn or soybean on soybean for that matter. The other one that a lot of dairy farmers in the state, and this, that's my normal clientele are dairy farmers. I'm working with one out of every 12 cows in the country right now. And is this kind of like four years of corn and four years of alfalfa type rotation. And there's some challenges with that. The first is that we got four years of corn. And corn yields over time tend to come down. Data, it, Time and time again, there's been university data, good research that shows that from year one to year two, there's about a 15% yield drag on corn yields. And yet the most profitable crop that almost any farmer grows on their farm is first year corn. No matter where you are in the country, whatever, but if you start looking at, at, at return on investment, dollars, turn per acre, almost any metric, first year corn is the most profitable crop we grow. Where it gets harder to justify is year two, year three, year four, or uh, some dairies will have year 20. Like they've always planted corn next to the barn type thing and then they haul a bunch of manure on it and it kind of works. And then we go into first year alfalfa. And that's kind of hit and miss. Like we, we end up with some, uh, we could have some decent crops on first year alfalfa, but it certainly is more hit and miss and not as consistent yield. And then you get a couple years of better yields if it doesn't winter kill, and then it starts slowing down again. And then by year nine, you're back into corn. That would be a pretty typical kind of rotation. You know, in 1973, Wisconsin, they said that our average yields on alfalfa in the state were 4.3 tons of dry matter per acre. And in 2015, they said that the average yields of alfalfa in Wisconsin were 4.1 tons. So in a 50 year period, 40 year period, when all of the rest of agriculture was making huge increases, especially on row crops and genetics and management and yields, Alfalfa actually lost yields. 
And there's a number of reasons why, I think, and I would say probably the first is more aggressive harvest schedules. You know, farmers making an effort to try to make better and better quality feeds, so they're cutting it more aggressively. Um, larger machinery. Alfalfa does not like compaction. We're running semi trucks and trailers and carts and 50,000 pound choppers and things across these fields. Uh, it seems like we've had more erratic weather that has is, that is hurt uh, alfalfa stands. It's hard to gain yields when every couple of years you get winter kill and damage. And maybe lastly is just diseases in alfalfa are continuing. You ever see like the, the insect or uh, disease resistant ratings on alfalfa and now they're like 33 of 35 or 30. They keep coming out with more diseases and they keep trying to keep up but they have it. So alfalfa yields have came down and a big part of this is because of this kind of, this kind of issue. But what happens if we replace the alfalfa? You know, everybody thinks, like, if I'm going to come up here and talk about soils, if I'm going to talk about sustainability, if I'm going to talk about building uh, less uh, runoff and nutrient management, I'm going to talk about more perennials. And there's, there's certainly a place for perennials uh, in highly erodible ground and things. But I would argue that those are probably should be more perennial grasses, not alfalfa. But to me, the key that solves a lot of our rotation issues, if we're committed to planting corn on our farm, is to eliminate the perennial and tighten up these cropping rotations. So what if we replace the alfalfa and we replace it with different annuals, different things? There's a whole group of, and we'll talk about those some, but things that could fit that place. And the beauty of it is that now, instead of corn four years, alfalfa four years, we're dropping another crop in the middle between these corn years. And that does a number of things for us. One, it makes all the corn on our farm first year corn. So in our dairy, Dairies, we're running about 1,200 acres right now between my farms. About 80% of my farm is set up in this rotation. We still have about 20% of it on perennial grass clover mixes, uh, poorly drained soils, highly erodible soils, things that we, and, I, and my goal is to keep those in perennials forever. But on about 80% of our farm, we've taken the perennial out, and we've moved to annual mixes. So there's a lot of talk about cover crops and adding cover crops into rotations. And uh, there's been a huge amount of effort of planting cover crops into standing corn uh, or interceding it into corn or trying to figure out ways to get it in. And the challenge we have when we move farther north in Wisconsin is we just don't have time to plant diverse cover crop mixes after corn just doesn't work hardly. So we're pretty much regulated to small grains. And that doesn't really do it for us. It might do it for like managing nutrients, but it doesn't do it for diversity and feeding different plant biology and uh, soil biology and uh, that diverse mixers do. And we just don't have that time factor. And we don't even have time for legumes to, to start nodulizing and, and creating nitrogen. And so my approach is if we can eliminate the perennial, we can put diverse cover crop mixes together for a whole year in between years of corn that make really, really good forage. And what it does is instead of having this yield curve like we showed on the existing, on that previous slide, over an eight year period, everything above this line becomes additional yield. Not only did we get more yield out of these annual mixes, combining a warm season, cool season type thing, than we did out of our alfalfa, we improved all our corn yields as well. We're looking at like a 35% yield bump. So we can take these diverse mixes, like maybe have a, a legume component, 
uh, a cool season grass component, a warm season grass component. Uh, and, and there's a lot of different things you could put into this. It, it gives us diversity to feed different soil biology. It gives us some diversity to minimize weather risks, whether it's cool and wet or hot and dry. It raises our floor. And it also gives us diversity in, in temperature um, needs and requirements. And so when we can put cool season, warm seasons together, it helps to um, manage the variations that we have here in the upper Midwest. The issue with strictly warm season monocultures is that in reality, we only have 60 optimal growing days in Wisconsin for those kind of crops. Sometimes, you know, our GDU accumulation on sorghum is something over 60 degrees. And how, much, how many days do we have where our nights are staying above 60 degrees? You know, it's maybe 50, 60, like there's that period of time from the end of June to the middle end of August, then it starts cooling off. And so we're looking for some diversity to try to bring that out. These are just cocktail mixes that we're using on our farm. So this is BMR sorghum sedan. So it's a brown midrib. So we're focusing on the digestible fiber component of it. Uh, there's Italian ryegrass in here. That's down underneath. Uh, there's red clover, there's bursine clover, which is kind of like an annual alfalfa, and there's hairy vetch. So we got a, a legume component there. But that's just one, that's just one of the mixes. You can kind of see what that does. Is, so this farm is cutting it. And normally, if you were cutting sorghum sedan, you'd have a, lunch, a lot of bare dirt underneath it because it's not a sod forming grass. It's, but this mix, we can come through and cut it, and you can see we got all this green underneath here, and that's the ryegrass. And it does a number thing for us. It helps us, this rotation, helps us grow so much more digestible fiber per acre. And if you're focused on, on doing, uh, if you have livestock, and you're focused on feeding high forage diets, that's the number one prerequisite to a high forage diet is having digestible fiber. Like we can bring some starch in, we can bring some protein in if we need to, but energy is the hardest thing to do. And, and most of the energy is caught up in that digestible fiber. That's our opportunity. And so, um, and so when I look at my equation for digestible fiber, as we look at the total fiber pool, which is your NDF, your neutral detergent fiber, and then we look at how digestible that fiber is. And we can multiply those things, and then you times it, the dry matter. So you take, like this corn silage sample here is 38% fiber. The digestibility of that fiber was 55%. And then you can multiply it by the dry matter that we have per ton, per acre, the alfalfa. And you can see when you get over into these annual forages, they have huge amounts of digestible fiber. So if you do the math on this alfalfa sample, somebody has your calculator, I want to run off to your top of your head, but 0.36, so of every pound of alfalfa that you're feeding, 36% of it is fiber. There's probably 20 some percent is protein and there's, there's uh, there's some sugars there, there's ash, which is your minerals and your dirt and, uh, and your NFCs, but about 36% of it is fiber. And of that fiber, 45% is digestible. So what is that, like 18% uh, maybe? If it was 50, per no, if it was 50%, it would be 18%. So it's about 16% of every pound of this alfalfa that you're feeding is digestible fiber. And that's an important number because digestible fiber has about the same amount of energy as starch or sugar. So if you're wanting to do, say, grass-fed beef, for instance, or grass-fed dairy, that's an incredibly important number to focus on. But if you look up here, like this triticale or cocktail mixes, these annuals, not only do they have a larger fiber pool, 52%, the digestibility of that fiber is so much better. And so 65% of 52% is what, 34%? We're looking at twice the amount of digestible fiber per pound. 
you multi, you overlay that with your yields and you're looking at doubling the amount of digestible fiber per acre per year in this kind of rotation. Incredibly important metric. You know, if you're a dairy farm and you're looking concerned about phosphorus load, the challenge we have is that a lot of dairy rations have a lot of byproducts in them. So we're feeding cottonseed, soy hulls, gluten, distiller's grain, uh, beet pulp, citrus pulp, depending where we are, like all these different things. They put a lot of byproducts in. They're reasonable. They're good digestible fiber sources. If you look at your farm as phos neutral though, and the only phosphorus that leaves your farm is in the meat or the milk that you're exporting, that only makes up about 20% of a cow's diet. That means that if you want to truly be FOSS neutral on your farm, you have to produce 80% of what your cows eat it has to come from the same acres that your manure is going on to on your farm. And that's almost impossible to do with low forage diets. So we need to look at ways to increase the forage percentage so we can cycle nutrients on these farms and keep those, those numbers down. These are just some, some values I have here, and these are dry matter values, and these are outdated. Like corn silage is worth a lot more than that now. But even on these like, older historical numbers, uh, we're looking at over an eight year rotation, we're looking at over $2,000 extra feed per acre. Yes. Yeah, so on a normal rotation, like if I'm planting, like this mix here, this would be corn silage. We would be planting winter triticale after it. We would harvest the trit middle of May, and then we would harvest the cocktail mix three more times. So we're looking at a four cut system. But there's certainly other products we can use too, depending on what kind of uh, animal groups we're feeding. Like are we feeding mature heifers and dry cows or beef cattle? So our quality metrics are gonna look different. And so we could plant like a photoperiod sensitive sorghum sedam, which is a single cut product uh, and make it once a year. The problem with that is that it's not really lactating cow feed. So, um, so there's different products. We're looking at about four times. When we talk about soil compaction though, when most compaction happens, it's not here in the middle of the summer. It's either you know, late fall manure applications, early spring when, when things are wet. Um, so soil moisture and manure applications and, and harvest to some level, but I think manure applications are a big problem. And so in these kind of rotations, we are putting all of our manure out on these dairies after the triticale comes off, so end of May and before the cocktail gets planted, and also uh, surface applying uh, between cuttings some and the goal is to put the majority of the manure on our farm on these years, not on the corn years. Because we don't want to be applying manure in October or early spring if we can get away from that. So we're trying to move our manure applications more to when things are drier. Yes, Kevin. So are you using liquid or compost manure? Yeah, most of these farms are liquid. On our farm, we do do some composting. Um, but even there, we have a we have pits with some liquid stuff too. So, yes. So you had said that on your farm, you are twenty percent highly erodible land. Yep. We flip it here in the Cooley region. We're eighty percent yep. highly erodible. How's this system going to work on steep land? Yeah. So. Yeah, so the question is, is here, you know, you have like 80% of your farms are highly erodible. And how do these things work? Well, largely we're in a no-till situation then. So that's the, that's the goal. And when we're working in no-till or very minimal till, uh, they can work really well. And I have farms, you know, all through between here and the Mississippi down through that we've been working with this program. But almost all of them were going to no-till or maybe uh, just a just a VT once every two years or something. Uh, but it, you need to. On very highly erodible soils though, and like I said, that's where I would 
lean towards perennial grass, maybe clover mixtures, uh, if we want to go that direction. But there again, like, are you still planting corn? <laughs> and if you're not, to me, most of our erosion issues happen either in corn or in alfalfa, where alfalfa, even though it's a perennial, we just don't have those fine fibrous root systems to stabilize soils. Yes? So, I run this in SNAP Plus. Yep. It works great because you have a cover crop after corn silage, then you've got something growing all next year, except for that little interval, but if you don't, don't mind seeding into that stuff that you had there, you've got your, and if you don't kill it in spring that's been killed, you're seeding into it right away, and then you have a cover crop that year going into the corn silage the next year. So, Exactly. Yeah. So the goal is less tillage, <laughs> uh, having a continuous crop growing all the time. And like on our farm, the only tillage we do is we were on one VT pass after our triticale and before our cocktail mix. So once every two years, we're running a single vertical tillage pass, like two inches deep. And that, that's just to help because then we don't have to actually spray it. Um, and that's on our conventional ground. Uh, we're not on organic stuff. Of course, we have weed control with corn and stuff. But on our conventional ground, I still don't like spraying. And uh, so in this kind of rotation, I'm not using any herbicides uh, any in here. I'm only using a corn herbicide once every two years. That's the only herbicide in the whole rotation, and one tillage pass every two years uh, to knock my trit out and to allevi alleviate allopathy issues that I would have. Because the triticale, small grains can put off allopathy, which would uh, impact grasses, especially in their viability. Okay, harvest costs come down uh, just because, largely because we're making, we're getting more tonnage per pass. And this is something that's kind of interesting. Like we think, like guys are like, well, hey, we eliminate the alfalfa, like we're not gonna have nitrogen credits. Well, in reality, we actually have more end credits. And this is partially through the fixation of the clover or the legumes if we put those into these cocktail mixes. But more than that, I think it's about how many, what kind of nitrogen are, are you stabilizing? How much did you keep from like manure applications and things that could have otherwise gotten away from you? So nitrogen is just protein divided by 6.25. That's all it is. So it's pretty easy. So if you think of like what kind of biomass you have out there, at any point of time, and that's above and below ground. Like, so say you have 1,000 pounds of biomass per acre. And we, if you take below ground, it's probably more like 2,000 pounds. So you have some, whether it's ryegrass or triticale or, or clovers or whatever it is, alfalfa, and it's 25% protein. When it's little like that, it's hot, it's 25% protein. If you had 1,000 pounds of biomass, it's 25% protein. That means you have 250 pounds of protein per acre. Divide that by 6.25 pounds, 6.25, and that's how many pounds of nitrogen that you have stabilized in that biomass. The only thing that legumes do for you is that they're pulling that actually atmospheric nitrogen in. <clears throat> but any any growing plant can stabilize N. And on most dairy farms where we have a lot of manure, we have lots of nitrogen that never, we never utilize. I had a farm south of Green Bay a couple years ago, fall applied 15,000 gallons of manure after corn silage on bare dirt. And he incorporated it. And the next spring we tested it, he had total of eight pounds of nitrogen left. <laughs> So he put like 150 pounds an acre of nitrogen out there in that manure and it was gone. And 
And that not only, not only is it a huge pollution concern, it's also a financial concern. Like that's worth real dollars. And just because he didn't have any sort of living plant material to stabilize that and take it up, it was, it was lost. And so in a rotation, you know, you get this end credit, and maybe it's more than 100 pounds, maybe it's 150, I don't know, whatever that number is. But on, on the trip rotation over four years, you're actually looking like a lot more because we've actually stabilized a lot of those nutrients. Phosphorus mover rates. On that previous rotation of four years corn, four years alfalfa, looking at book values for percentages, we're looking at a total of 28.62 pounds per acre of FOSS. On the cocktail, triticale rotation, we're at 38. Increased it by a third. And there's other considerations too. And, that, you know, and these are hard to quantify, but, um, you know, what is the cost of manure application in the summer versus fall? Like, if you don't have to struggle with, with, <laughs> with mud and with, uh, or weight limits in the spring or um, whatever those, those issues are, like, what's the difference in cost? Or even custom manure applicators. Like, will they give you a deal to apply it in the summer versus in the fall when all your neighbors want to as well? Um, you know, reduce compaction pressure by trying to move more of our cropping to the middle of summer where, where soils are drier and, and things. Take the pressure off the shoulders. You know, uh, maybe some of these cover crops, they may, there may be options or opportunities for cost sharing. I don't know what that all looks like, but, uh, you know, even just neighbor public relations. Like, this is a good story to tell. And especially if you're you know, in, a, in an area with a lot of environmental type pressure. And, and this is a really good public relations story to tell. There's things that we can do. Even pollinator habitat and, uh, and that opportunity. So I just want to talk a little bit about that cocktail mix more that I taught. And that just because it's the most popular one that I've developed. But there's all kinds of different ways you can go and you can develop um, so that we're planting about 35, 40 pounds an acre. Uh, so we're harvesting that about 45 days after planting. So 40 to 45. So we're planting it maybe the Memorial Day. Uh, after a triticale comes off, we put manure out, we plant it around Memorial Day. We're harvesting that maybe the 10th of July. And about 30 days after that, um, so the middle of August. And then after that, we're waiting till October. So it cools down, um, the ryegrass starts coming in and we're harvesting it in the fall again. We need to be at least four inches high to get regrowth. Any, any warm season annual, like sorghum, sedan, sedan grass, millet, all of those need to be cut high if you want to get regrowth or grazed. And the reason for that is there's these internodal growth nodes, and you need two of those to get optimal regrowth. So the taller a plant gets, those those growth nodes become farther apart. And rule of thumb is you need to leave at least 10% of the residual as residual if you want to get regrowth. So if your plant is 40 inches high and you're cutting it or grazing it, you need to leave at least four inches. If it's 60 inches high, which sorghum sedan can go from 40 inches to 60 inches in about three days time, um, you need to be at least six inches high. So just very critical to get those, those heights right if you want regrowth. We're running around one and a half to two tons dry matter per cutting. Our qualities are running 12 to 18% protein. We're running 150 to 200 RFQ depending on the crop. Um, when we're harvesting it, we're looking at corn silage type moistures, 60 to 70%. Uh, 65 is a really good number for packing on drive over piles or um, maybe less for baleage. And we're really using lactic acid inoculants at that stage. You have a lot of sugars, so that, that you have that going for you. So just a simple inoculant can really help uh, work with that. So we need one to one and a half pounds nitrogen per growing day per acre, and you need to split apply. Things like sorghum sedan are 
luxury feeders. You can't put the whole year out at one time if you're using commercial fertilizer because it will take it up. Now, if manure is a big part of your nutrient management plan, you have that carbon aspect of manure that slows down the release more over the season. So that helps. But if you're strictly using commercial fertilizer, you need to split apply every crop. One to one and a half pounds per growing day. So if it's 45 days, you're gonna want maybe 60 pounds an end. If it's 30 days, you're gonna want 35, 40. And then prussic acid is something that, you know, a lot of people have heard about, but just something to keep in mind. Prussic acid is, is these compounds that are in the cell walls of sorghum, sorghum sedan, and sedan grass. Millet doesn't have it. But there's these the compounds, and when you freeze, those, those cell walls crack and leak out. And when they hit each other, they turn into prussic acid, which is basically cyanide. And I've only ever had two farms that lost cattle to prussic acid, but it's scary when it happens. And the one was actually right not that far away from here, down in the Driftless area, south of Waste. Um, a dairy farmer uh, in kind of a hill farm uh, sent his cows out to graze some sorghum sedan after morning milking down in by the river and uh, didn't realize it had froze down there. And uh, he lost like half a dozen of them. <laughs> and uh, I had another dairy, or it was a heifer farm uh, over by Berlin, Wisconsin, uh, and there put his heifers out into a pasture but they were sharing a fence with a sorghum sedan field on the morning it froze. And they lined up along the fence and were grazing the sorghum sedan. And they were, and he lost some heifers there too. The nice thing about prussic acid is because it's a gas, it volatizes. And over a period of time, it's gone. Most places will say seven to 10 days. In reality, it's probably only a day or two, but it volatizes. If you're harvesting forage, you can cut it that day, you can harvest it that day, you can do whatever you want with it, you just can't feed it that day. If you did it in a baling situation, you could remove that through the plastic? Yeah, through fermentation, it dissipates it, yep. Yeah, it'll be fine. Yep. Yep, so it's just a matter of it, just a matter of time factor. So I like to tell people, well, wait till it ferments. But in reality, yeah, it's just a time factor. So, And actually, that <laughs> for some of my farms, like if we plant photoperiod sensitive sorghum sedan, so photoperiod sensitive is where normal sorghum sedan goes reproductive on a time, you know, 60 days after planting, it starts shooting ahead, whatever, it goes reproductive. Photoperiod sensitive sorghum sedan only goes reproductive when you get less than 12 hours and 20 minutes of daylight. And for us in Wisconsin, that's somewhere, what, end of September, middle end of September. And so we plant this when we don't want a seed head and it gets big, you know, 10 feet tall. Uh, and then we come through and harvest it in the fall. And a lot of farms actually wait for it to freeze to help it start drying down standing because it is very wet. It's 80%, 82% moisture standing. And, uh, and it's a huge crop. And so we actually use the frost to help us speed up that drying process. So it's not prussic acid. It's nothing to be afraid of. Just be mindful that like if you're grazing or green chopping, that's when you want to be mindful about it. Otherwise, in any or sort of normal harvest schedule, it's not an issue. Okay, any questions? Yes? Yeah, so on perennial dry hay mixes, there's all kinds of options. You know, uh, using a lot of endophyte free tall fescue, meadow fescue, orchard grass, um, those all have you know, high quality potential and have, are easy to make dry hay out of. You can mix legumes with them, very small amounts of some red clover, alfalfa of course works. Uh, on the annual side, there's very few options for making dry hay on annuals. Teff is almost the only option I know that'll consistently make dry hay in our part of the country. Now we go farther west on drought 
you know, in, in, in the plains, they'll make sorghum sedan or millet dry hay, but we just can't do that here. And so when it comes to annuals, about the only thing that we can consistently make dry hay out of, it's teff. The other option, and this is probably more of a southern thing. I mean, it works here, but it's, it's probably not productive, is using Timothy as an annual. So I have farms through like uh, Missouri, Kentucky, southern Indiana, kind of southern Midwest, where we'll plant Timothy after corn silage, and then we'll harvest it in May for dry hay. Single crop, it's cheap to plant, 30, 35 bucks an acre, works as our winter cover, makes beautiful dry hay, we take it out and plant sorghum or something after it. Um, but uh, up here, the problem, Timothy is such a slow maturing grass that it's not ready to harvest till the middle of June. And by that time, you've given up some yield potential from your next crop. So probably not as great of option up here. But, uh, but yeah, TEF is about the only thing on the annual side. So if you're committed to dry hay, we're probably moving more into a perennial, maybe more aggressive rotation, like two to three years, taking it out, putting corn in, no-till it into it. Try to tighten that up a little bit if you can, but you're probably in a perennial setting. Kevin? It, the allopathy, yes. Uh, I'm just kind of curious, like you said, vertical tillage, are you using like lemkin or? Is yeah, yeah, we have a farm mat, but similar. They're all pretty much the same. Yeah, so we're hitting at it about two inches. So allopathy is in the top half inch or inch. And so any sort of tillage will dissipate that. There's some thought that even a really aggressive no-till coulters are enough to, to do it but it takes some tillage to dissipate that. Otherwise, it's just a time factor of maybe 10 days. And we don't really like to give that up if we don't have to. So allopathy doesn't affect legumes, and it doesn't affect as much large seeded crops like corn. But small seeded grass crops are, large, are affected very aggressively, and the smaller they are, the more they're affected. So uh, just something to keep in mind. And uh, yeah, you need to do something with that or there's a time factor. Dan? Yes. On thinking of compaction again, mm -hmm. doing these mixes, do we have less compaction just because of- the Oh, definitely, finance? definitely. Can you address that? Yeah, so there's, um, there's this fibrous root systems and having diversity in root systems help to create this this mat or that helps to spread the weight out <laughs> over, over more square inches. So just like we talk about flotation tires, what they're doing is actually spreading the weight out over more cubic inches or, or square inches. The root systems underneath the ground can do the very same thing. Now alfalfa that's more of a tap root, doesn't really have the lateral roots, doesn't help us that much. But when we work with crops like grasses, like especially um, grasses that have really fine fibrous lateral roots, they work to suspend the machinery and it cushions that. So it spreads the weight out and we don't have the compaction that's vertically uh, going down. I think that slide you showed that when you were cutting it and not doing it was still green, to me it's yeah. very powerful. Yep. Because now we're not, usually our wheel traffic yeah, exactly. Yeah, spreading that out. And that's. A permanent cover crop. So you mean uh, planting corn into like something or that would like a into a perennial? Yeah, I think it was. I think everyone's thinking about it over. So the closest thing I've done to it, uh, and this is still very much in research phase, but uh, last year, so in 2021, I planted a cover crop mix on a new piece of ground we picked up. And this is a, 
it, it was across the railroad track, across the four-lane highway, couldn't get manure there. Um, pretty tough piece of dirt. And uh, I planted a cocktail mix that was uh, forage oats, peas, Italian ryegrass, heavy legume mix, and a little bit of a, a hybrid brassica. So pretty diverse mix, but I put actually a, a, an improved red clover, like a four-year red clover with it, just to get more vigorous uh, red clover growth than, a, growth than a medium. We harvested that three times in 2021. And then last spring, I had this amazing clover crop uh, out there. <laughs> and I no-till corn into it. The clover was about a foot high. This is not organic. It was about a foot high. We no-till corn into it. And then I called up my neighbor who does the spring. And I'm like, hey, if you could just hit that. Um, and I, my goal was not to kill the clover. I just wanted to make it kind of sick for a few days. <laughs> so my corn got ahead. Well, it was like a week later. And I went over there. And it wasn't dying. And here he hadn't sprayed it yet. And now the clover is like over knee high and the corn is just spiking. And I have, I have clover that's like this. And so we actually went out with our triple mower and we cut it all and, and made baleage out of it and took the clover off. And then I called him up or, and then, and he came and sprayed. And so all we did was like a, like a half rate of Roundup and it didn't kill the clover. It slowed it down a bit. Uh, the corn got over it, and by fall, we had a pretty much a solid clover mat again. And I think you can, if you timed it right and got your herbicide program in place, you could, there's some potential there. Uh, but you'd have to know what you're doing, and, and of course, you're working under label, like we're using a lot less overall chemicals than what they're talking about. So on that farm, we put zero fertilizer on. And this is, this is a pretty bad dirt. We put zero fertilizer on, and we got 112 bushels of corn an acre off of it last year. And most people are going to say, like, that's, that was a failure. Like, you know, the neighbors probably did 160. But if I look at my budgets on that field, because it's cheap ground, no fertility cost, I no-tilled the corn in, I had 20 bucks of, to spray it, like I made like almost $500 an acre on this piece of ground, um, 400 some dollars clear, which, and besides I got over a ton of dry matter of clover that I harvested off. So I think there's certainly some potential there. I'm just not sure, I don't have enough uh, experience to like make solid recommendations yet, but the things that I've found that have worked the best with the whole season of canopy and corn are certainly legumes. Uh, and probably either ladino clover or red clover handle that shade the best. And then maybe hairy vetch would be a little farther down the line. Yeah. Yep. I, to me, you just hit on something in terms of how do we respond to what we see? Because not everything works out the way we always want it to. No. Maybe talk about some failures, successes, and things you needed to do. Yeah, so that is, you know, when you think of corn or alfalfa, we have 100 years or 200 years, whatever, of combined knowledge and education and research. And, like, we kind of figured it out, more or less. <laughs> and so we're just fine-tuning the system. But when we start looking at all these different like annuals, a lot of farms have never ever planted these kind of species or varieties on their farm. And when we start looking at diverse mixes, it's even, there's even more variables. And so, yeah, we certainly have some failures. I mean, one of the things that is kind of frustrating to me is some of the, is like seed companies that, that put these really diverse mixes together with like 30 different things. When in reality, I go out that next year and you walk through the field and there's only five species that I can find. Like, they just, you know, just going through the warehouse and throwing stuff together for the sake of diversity probably isn't a success to me. Because just because it showed up on a seed tag doesn't mean that's what you had in the field. So maybe for the first year, that's okay. 
but go spend some time identifying what actually worked on your farm, what actually grew on your farm, and let's fine tune that. Like why blow money on something that doesn't show up? The second thing is that if you're feeding this stuff, you want to, like that's our, we still need to make money. We still need to be profitable. And some of the, some of the regenerative egg educators, people who are very passionate and, and have done some amazing things with fixing soils. But we still need to cash flow. Like we still need to be profitable. If you want a truly sustainable farm, like it has to make money. And the easiest way to make money uh, and the easiest way to lose money is to grow something that doesn't feed very well. If you have to, uh, if your animals don't perform on it, that's a problem. And so if you're planting sorghum sedan, you need to be planting a brown midrib variety. If you're planting a millet, you need to be planting a brown midrib variety. Like we need, to, if you're planting ryegrass, it has to be a really high quality Italian ryegrass. Like don't throw some cheap annual ryegrass in that heads out every 16 days. So there's some, um, there's some real, like the mistakes that I've seen done is ones that just like feel really good about throwing a bunch of stuff in a mix. But when it comes to the, the actual thought process behind it, there hasn't been a lot of that done. Um, or um, like sunflowers are a great example. Like everybody likes sunflowers and cover crop mixes and they're pretty. Uh, they're, there's some diversity there and they probably do some things for soil. But forage quality of sunflowers is absolutely awful. Like the fiber quality in sunflowers is, it's really, really bad. And there was a seed company a few years ago going around like trying to promote planting sunflowers and corn together for corn silage. And I like, this, I, like a cow would not want to eat this stuff, but they're grinding it all up together and making them. And so just thinking that through like more holistically, like, and how that works. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the beans and critic daily, they come up great. But... Yeah, so seed depth is an issue. Like that, um, we can't bury clover two inches in the ground like we are inch and a half, especially on sandy soil. It's really easy to get stuff buried really deep. And just, so seed depth is really challenging. I don't have as big a concern about like sorting. Like most of my stuff, I do have some farms where we'll put like all the small seed in like a, in one mix and our larger seed, like our ryegrass and our small grains or whatever together in another mix in two boxes. But if we can get our seed depth right, I just put it all together. But the seed depth is, is very important. And so, you know, if you have stuff that should be planted at a half inch, we kind of have to plant the whole thing there a little close. There's some thought process that it'll, if it's all in the same trench, it'll follow up the other things. So, you know, if you have oats that'll press up from an inch and a half down, the clover seed that's laying next to it will follow it up. But uh, don't take that too far, you know? So yes, I, that, that's a good point. Yes? You mentioned the heliopathic properties of the small grains. So this year I'm following uh, winter rye with uh, brown midrib pearl millet. Mm -hmm. Beautiful feed, yeah, amazing so feed. I got some really good feedback from my customers. Um, what, what besides spraying the, the winter rye should I do as a precaution against the, you know, the, that heliopathic property of okay. the rye against the pearl milk? Are you doing any tillage between those crops? I can. I can do, I can do a real minimal tillage. Yeah, and that's all it takes. And how long do I... Do I you, know, you don't have to wait at all if you do some tillage. So two inch, like yep, hit it about two inches deep. That's all you need to do. Okay, thank you. Yep, so any sort of tillage will eliminate it. The other thing is allopathy is it comes off, the plant puts it out when it's dying. So what some of my guys are doing, like if we're going from a small grain to say, 
Italian ryegrass, sorry about that. Um, I'll actually come and plant my Italian, I'll no-till it into my small grain, like in April. And then when I harvest off my, my triticale or my rye, that's up and ready to go. We don't have any allopathy when it's growing, it's only when it's dying. And it only affects it, when it for germination and early seedling vigor. So we don't ever have that issue. And the only allopathy that's coming off is actually helping control weed pressure and unwanted things at that point. But you can't plant millet in April. You need soil temp 60 degrees plus. So ideally you would run one tillage pass through. Otherwise the only way is to wait. And that's probably like a 10 day wait between the time you cut till you plant your millet again. Um, you're probably gonna get some regrowth rye depending at what stage you cut your rye. And that could actually act as a weed. We're about there, right? I think we ran enough time. One more, one more. Okay. I, just, just how prescriptive is this method that, that you're talking about in terms of maybe we got this type soil type or we're mm -hmm. using manure, we're not using manure in, terms, in, in regards to what you're talking about yep. and changing the forage. So the very first question when I build a forage plan for a farm is what animal groups are we feeding this to? So that's the first thing. It always comes down to the nutrition. So what animal groups are you feeding it to? Are you feeding it to dry cows? Are you feeding it to bread heifers? Feeding young calves? Are you trying to grass fed finished beef? Are you feeding it to lactating dairy cows? So that's the first thing. The second is how much of it are you gonna feed? So what's the inclusion rate of the ration? Like if we're just looking for a fiber source, even in a lactating diet, like at a two pound dry matter inclusion, that's a different product than what, if we're wanting to make up the majority of our diet. So those are the, so it always starts with the cow. And then the next is, um, is what your soil types are, what crop are you gonna be following it with, <laughs> um, in water, do you have water challenges, too much, not enough? Like, so, yeah, um, and that is going to start dictating what kind of species you put into these diverse mixes. And so I can't like come up here, like I said, I threw this one up just as an example, but I'm not gonna say like go and plant that on all of you guys' farms because uh, we're gonna tweak it depending on what kind of needs you have, what kind of animals you're feeding. With nine kids. Well, we got four farms. <laughs> no, I don't know. You know, they won't all want a farm, but we are trying to, um, you know, it's kind of interesting where they, they all have different interests and different things. Uh, and my oldest is 18 now. And uh, uh, he's really uh, probably not a cow person, uh, but he's really into like, he'll, he can wire anything, he can do plumbing, he can do some mechanical stuff, whatever. So I just kind of, he does all the stuff for me, just odds and ends and between the farms, he keeps him pretty busy. My second one is the cow person. So he, at the genetic dairy right now, he's almost managing that by himself and he's 17. Uh, but all, you know, we have an IVF lab where we're doing a cl collection, we're uh, helping with data, uh, mating decisions and things. Uh, we show cattle all, all over the country um, and he's involved in that. And then, you know, but each one of the children have different interests and I at least want to have opportunities for them. It doesn't mean they all take them or they all stick with it, but we're trying to create opportunities and diversify the farm where we can just to kind of fit their, their interest and, and skills.